with um, introducing you guys. And uh, the first uh, guest is uh, Karen Costello, who's the creative chair at Deutsch LA. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I try to dig up a little bit of um, dirt on you guys, but um, two things about you, three things about you. I love the fact that you were the outgoing CCO when Danny, I think, might have like taken that position, uh, which I think is very, uh, this is a unique thing for us. I love that. Um, and you read Deutsch Prior, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love it. Um, but even more interesting is that you were uh, the person responsible for the Target uh, live video with Gwen Stefani on the Grammys many years. I don't know how long ago, but that's, tell us about that. That's really quite extraordinary. I saw it, by the way. It was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, I love to do, I'm, even though so I, I'm sort of a low-key person, I love to do really, really ambitious things. And I get really excited about like, ooh, that's never been done. Let's try to do it. And I think that that opportunity with Target, they just bought, you know, like I think at the time, like eight 30 second spots during the Grammys. And we're just like, well, why couldn't we just put all that 30 seconds together and give like a two minute gift to viewers, which is something you watch the Grammys because you want to see musical performances. Let's do a musical performance and let's make it even harder for ourselves. And let's actually create a live music video real time during a commercial break like that had never been done. Gwen Stefani was super up for it. Um, it was really scary because it's, you know, if you mess up, you're doing it on live TV. Um, but it just made the sort of the risk and the reward that much, like the the reward that much higher because you're putting yourself out there. And it it was just such a testament to the relationship we had with our target team at the time because we all just sort of decided to hold hands and jump off the cliff together. And it ended up paying out hugely, but um, it was really exciting. But we literally did build it live on TV. That's amazing. So like, I, obviously there must've been things that happened that the audience didn't see. Was there anything that you can tell us that happened that was just like, you were like, oh my God, this is like gonna die live. Did anything yeah. happen? Oh. Well, yeah, because Gwen Stefani, she's super, super professional and she's known for being really, really rigorous with all of her rehearsals and stuff. And you know, you have a timer that says, hey, you're going live in five minutes, four minutes, three minutes, <laughs> like a countdown. And like three minutes before we were going to go live, she's like, I just want to practice this one more thing <laughs> or like five minutes. And we're like, no, no, don't do any more practice. And she said, I insist. And then she did it and she fell. Like she fell on the skates oh. and she like, and, and we were like, oh my gosh, no, this is, but um, you know, she's a total pro and she's like, I'm fine. I'm fine. And she got up, but it was, it was like, that moment was quite terrifying. It was like, oh my god. Oh my God. I love it. I love it. I knew there was something behind the scenes that we didn't see. Oh, yeah. There's always something, isn't there? Right. Exactly. Last thing is that you went to Art Center, which is really quite extraordinary. Um, I don't know what year you went, but there's always some some famous, you know, somebody that comes from there aside from yourself. Was there anybody <laughs> that was outstanding uh, in your class? Um, I, you know, it's interesting. Um, it's part of my probably my happy accident story, but um, I actually entered um, Art Center as a design major. So design was my first love, graphic oh, design. Wow. I love that. And then I switched over into advertising. And part of why I switched was it seemed to be a little bit more fun. You got to interact with photographers and film people and stuff like that. And Tarsem was like a, a film right. student at the time. And I remember that shows you how old I am. Too. It's like my no, job. Please, I love it. I've been in kidding? the business for a long time. Um, but he was a film student and it was just, he, there was just so much kind of energy around the photography and film students at the time. And it just felt really energizing to be able to intersect with that. So um, I, I consider him famous. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. He was, he was genius and brilliant and, yeah. you know, and, uh, and so are you. Thank you very much. Um, our next guest is Danny Robinson. He's the CCO of the Martin Agency in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, welcome, Danny. Thank you, Oliver, very much. Absolutely. Um, I, uh, there's a couple of things about you. I mean, there's the list goes on and on and on. And um, you're um, an amazing giver to back to the community. Um, but I have to point out the Oprah Winfrey um, promotion, um, which was extraordinary. So I to tell us a little bit about that, the giveaway, which everybody uses as a part of the lexicon as part of like, you know, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I was um, fortunate enough 
fortunate enough to be at um, an agency, which is, as Karen said, part of my happy accident, so I won't talk about it. Um, <laughs> Vigilante, an agency I co-founded uh, in the early 2000s. And um, I tell people I had nothing to do with any of it other than I was the CCO of the agency at the time and was part of, the, of all of the work. Um, but that was really a, a, a media partnership in our agency and, and account lead in particular uh, was part of this idea that um, they were launch, uh, we had Pontiac as a client, they were launching a new car. Uh, and the idea was to spend the entire budget at one time uh, at the beginning of the launch. And this was before Oprah had given away anything. Uh, this is before her, uh, this was her, it was a, the premiere of her favorite show, her favorite things. Her favorite show, things, right, right, right. Uh, at that season. And the idea was to simply do the biggest thing we could do with all the money they had. Uh, and that was give everyone in the audience a car. That's which, crazy. Uh, was crazy. Uh, the, the, the amazing part was how in Oprah was on the idea. She was all in and she the you get a car was all hers she did she went beyond that she went to the to the factory in detroit and talked to the the workers and just was all in on this idea but it was a it became a, a catchphrase that she created that that we take credit for <laughs> i love that i love that you were also once voted by the stand-up new york comedy club as one of the funniest men in advertising tell us a little bit about that did you do open mics or what tell us yeah, I um I took a class at the new school when I was working in New York, and the final was an audition at a at a comedy club. At, oh um, my god! At New York. And the manager asked me if I wanted to come back, and I ended up for eight years. I was doing stand up between New York and, and Connecticut after work, um, so two or three clubs in New York, and then I was I lived in Connecticut, so I had a home base called the Treehouse Cafe, and that's where I worked every Wednesday. And started with open mic nights and ended up opening for some acts and opening for some music acts. And I did that. And then I guess I stopped. Well, I guess I stopped when I had, no, I had kids. I was still doing it. I don't know why I stopped. I think I, I, I think I stopped because I got tired of comedy. It was before the boom where every HBO and every, everybody was a comedian and was comics everywhere. And I said, I don't think I want to do this anymore. Uh, but I did it for eight years every week. Um, yeah, and weekends at some point. Did you, I mean, I know this is a stupid question, but did you bomb? Like, was there ever like the major bomb where you just walked on, you're like, you just, nobody did yeah, anything? I, um, I, I rarely bombed. I had a bad set. I opened for um, a music act on a Halloween, at a Halloween show, uh, and nobody really wanted to see me. <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were all there for the music act. So I, it was a half an hour of, of being, it may be ignored more than more than anything. Um, right. <laughs> so it was I two love hours of the show, and I two hours back, just asking myself why I drove two hours there. It was it was it was miserable. But you know, my shows were my shows were typically fine. They were not. <laughs> I love that. Well, maybe one of these days you'll reprise your uh, your uh, your uh, one of your best opening acts, and uh, maybe in can. I don't know. Maybe we should talk yeah, to you. I've, the I've thought about can. it, but I. I <laughs> Well, welcome. Thanks for sharing all that with us. Um, our last guest is Jessica Apelnese. Ap Ap Say it for me. Apellanis. Apellanis. I love that. It's a great It's a great name. And you're the ECD at Wyden Kennedy in Mexico City. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Um, so a couple of things. You're, like, there's a lot of um, our guests who uh, refuse to be on social media. So it's sometimes very difficult to find interesting little tidbits, but your first Instagram post was in January, 2011. And it was this picture of this dog and a guy in a bed sleeping. And it's the caption read, can we switch places? <laughs> you know, just like, maybe you can tell us about that. <laughs> yes. Those are Basquiat was the dog and Maniaco the cat. And I was <laughs> in this part of your life where you're working too much and you have to wake up early and they are leaving the bed but you have to leave <laughs> home so you you want to switch places with them <laughs> yeah, like, yeah exactly so I love it also you were an MTV, MTV producer talk about that that's really quite extraordinary yes and at that point I don't know if the audience knows this but it, it was a cool place to work at that time yeah absolutely 
at MTV. I was super proud of being and working at MTV. And, and actually there is where I found out that I should be a copywriter. I was requested to do a script and I was supposed to do a technical script of the top 20 videos of this week. And instead of doing a technical script, I did an actual copywriting and do the lines for the conductors of the show and blah, blah, blah. And then the, the director of the program said, you're not a producer, you're a copywriter. <laughs> uh, yes, a what? <laughs> a copywriter. And I think you should try to, to do this. And I know this person in this other agency, and I think you should try. I don't think you are an assistant producer. You should try. And that's wow. how I get advertising. I wasn't expecting, I thought I was a producer. <laughs> I love that. What Talk about a happy accident. Like, and yeah, what, yeah. A, what, a, what an amazing person that he would see this in you and have the, you know, the, the wherewithal to, to tell you, you know, uh, oh, and encourage you. How amazing, you know? Uh, well, you know, for our audience, it's like, listen, keep your ears open. I didn't know that that job existed. I thought they were creatives, but I didn't know that actually writing was something that you did in an agency. I thought you thought ideas. Jesse, you'd be surprised. There's a lot of um, a lot of our um, guests um, in the advertising world didn't know that advertising was a thing. They just, it, it, which I, yeah, Danny, I'm sure, and Karen as well. Like it's just a funny phenomenon that uh, a lot of the leaders have in in common. Um, so I think it's very interesting. But thank you, welcome. Um, we do have a time limit. I always blow it. So sorry, um, Addison. Um, um, but let's go with our first uh, question. Um, you know, we all have happy um, kind of accidents in our lives that lead us to uh, where we are today. So I'm going to start with uh, Danny. What was uh, your happy accident that played a part in leading you where you are today? Um, I was thrown into a, a freelance assignment uh, with a complete stranger. Um, it was a freelance assignment for Lieberman. They had Reebok as a client. And they were looking for outside help to for uh, some people who understood the Reebok audience a little bit better. Um, and I was put together by a, a friend, um, and I was a creative on the on the assignment. He was a business guy, and it was such a high profile assignment that the chief creative officer uh, Rick Fisdale at the time was involved. And he was really intrigued with the way we thought about strategy, the, how we understood the audience, and really that we had an unorthodox presentation um, that he asked us at the end of the assignment if we wanted to start an, a, a joint venture agency with Lear Manette to do what we did for them, for some of their other clients, and then to, to, to get, um, get our own clients. And through that freelance assignment, um, or it was born Vigilante, which is the agency I co-founded with Mark Strashan, who eventually became a partner and, and dear friend now. Um, but that was a, I shouldn't have even been freelancing because I had a job. That's one thing. Um, <laughs> uh, but it was, it was a fortuitous combination because the, my partner could have been a nightmare and he wasn't. Uh, it was probably the best partner I could have ever had. And, and it turned into uh, an agency where the Oprah idea came out of, uh, and where I worked for eight years before I came to Martin. Wow, I love that. Vigilante is a, a very prolific, and uh, I, I'd love to talk more about that, um, you know, uh, it, it, later on. But uh, how long? So it was eight years. Uh, I was there for eight. I was there for eight. Yeah, for eight years. Wow. Is Vigilante still uh, an agency that's? No, it shuttered a while ago now. Right. Wow. Oh, my yeah. God. Well, I'd love to talk to that uh, more, but thank you for that. Uh, what about you, Karen? What was your happy accident? Um, I have a few just because I, I feel like there's a lot of, you know, sort of cosmic things that sort of guide us all. I'm I'm sort of hippie like that. But I will say mine was about finding advertising. I have like not to be cliched with the other guests on this thing, but I didn't know advertising was a thing when I was like going to college or anything. And so when I first went to college, I knew I was creative, but like I, I didn't really know what to do with it. So I sort of studied art history. And then when I got out of college, I was like, oh, I'm going to go work for a museum or I'm going to be a curator. I'm going to go do something. So I ended up working at like a art gallery. Like I was sort of um, a receptionist, but also worked with the art gallery. But that art gallery happened to be in this like creative collective sort of big loft area that had 
uh, a design studio and an exhibition designer and a couple people who had just left Frank Gehry and were starting their own architectural firm. And it just like opened my mind. I was like, wait, what? Like you can be <laughs> creative, like you can do stuff that's not the art that I studied. And so I ended up were like just befriending a couple people in that design studio. I was so inspired by what they did. And I said, like, how do I do what you do? I love it. This is what I want to do. And that's when they said, well, you probably need to go to art school. Like you need to <laughs> do that. Um, and so John Coy, who, who had started that, happened to be an art center alum, but he gave me a whole list. He gave me art center and Cal arts and um, school of visual arts in New York. I mean, he gave me a list of like 10 art schools and and then I sort of investigated and ended up choosing Art Center. But I literally didn't even know advertising existed as a career until like I started as a designer and then went to Art Center. So that was kind of my happy accident that I just sort of landed in a place where I was exposed to the thing that actually lit me up. Like that was the thing that I wanted to do. So isn't that amazing? I mean, it's yeah. kind of similar to like Danny, I, you know, uh, you had multiple jobs at the time or you were you were doing pursuing multiple things at the time and then this happy accident happened um and it's interesting because i think like karen and probably jessica as well you know great leaders they at the beginning of the thing that they become uh most prolific in um there was a choice you made a decision you know what i mean and fearless um or fearful um, you made that decision, and that's what all um, great leaders do. So I love these two stories. Uh, thank you very much. They're they're very inspiring. Uh, what about you, Jessica? What was your happy accident? I think the the MTV uh, going from from from. I thought I was a producer because I loved the same <laughs> and I I was so proud of being a producer, and suddenly trying something new, and yeah, I, I think. I think that was it because I wouldn't even try if that person wouldn't told me this is not a technical script. This is an actual script and you write pretty good. I think you should try. Where did you get the, the where did you get the education or the understanding of writing uh, anything? I study uh, communication. So ah. it was in Mexico. It was the career you took with or like when you don't know what to study. So you study communications <laughs> because it has a little bit of everything. So tele television or radio and cinema and tons of stuff. So that was a career that I chose because I didn't know what to do. So in you, there, there were many stuff. And were you a journalist? Or did you journal as a as a as a young like a woman or as a child? Or did you have a diary or did you ever write any kind of stories? Or is this just something that was always in you? Now, now that you mention it, yes, I, I kept a journal when I was in, yeah, yeah, I did. I, I didn't thought about that, but yes, yes, yeah, I did a journal, yes. Yeah, but I love, I love, I mean, I love how you're so casual about, oh yeah, and I just became <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, you know, the EDD of widening Kennedy, Mexico City, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I applaud you. That's really wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, our next question is, um, this comes out of like a little bit of the pandemic, because I think we all remember at the beginning of the pandemic, there were so many of these words where if I heard like authentic or pivot or all these words one more time, you were going to shoot somebody, right? So I'm going to start with Karen. What was uh, the most inspiring and what is the most annoying word or words that have stood out in the past, let's say year or so, however many years you want to go back? Well, authentic is a good one. That, that was, uh, <laughs> I, I agree. Like, that's just like, ugh. so I would say that's one of them. But I also say, and I, I felt this at Cannes as well. I'm so tired of, of Gen Z, Gen Z, Gen Z. Like, oh my God, right? <laughs> like huge swaths of people and just labeling them Gen Z and they do this. It's like, I have two Gen, I'm raising two people in the Gen Z. <laughs> they, they're so um, unique. And anyway, I get super tired of just those like monolithic labels and I, I hate it. Yeah. I'm super tired of it. Um, one word that is super inspiring to me. Um, and I just, when I saw the, like when I saw the question, I was like, you know what? Like it keeps popping up, but it's the word resilience because uh. I love it in the world. I love it in my personal life. I love it for my kids. I love it in many, many ways. Um, and it's just, um, I love it. It's inspiring. So 
It, well, you know, when you when when I just heard that word, I mean, again, that that is an inspiring word because you can use it in any situation. You know, uh, you know, a young child at school who was bullied, or you know, or somebody who is you know down in their luck in life. You know, resilience. Well, the Ukrainians, really inspires people. like it's world, and then it's it's personal and it's macro. Yeah, like yeah, exactly. It's just, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I love it. Well, thank you for that. That's great. I really love that word. Uh, what about you, Danny? Um. The word I don't like has nothing to do with advertising. Uh, it may have to do with the generation. Um, the word like. <laughs> I don't mean when you actually <laughs> like something. Uh, it is similar to as it's sometimes used or maybe not even. It's it's a it's a filler word that I think replaced. um. Yes, it did. Yeah. I'd love to go back to um, I think. Um, <laughs> I, feel, you're, I feel seen, Danny. I think. Uh, yeah, you've yeah. wronged me. It's 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 no one's. I think it's the Kardashians' fault, but I'm not going to blame. I, I was going to say it's somebody from the Valley. Definitely <laughs> Valley people. You know, like uh, yeah, uh, and it, yeah, it is an '80s thing. Yeah, it never got here. Yeah, <laughs> I think it stayed West Coast, and, and it, it my it took 40 years to migrate. But that's that's fine. Whatever. Uh, beautiful constraint is my favorite two words. Oh, wow! It's, um, it's the title of a book by by Adam Morgan and Mark Barden, Barden, and it's a book that Kristen, our CEO, gave out to everyone uh, around the holidays. And it's the it's the notion that that sometimes wonderful things come out of having constraint. That you find ways around what some would some would say a box. Uh, you find great things can come out of being put in constraints. And uh, the book has wonderful examples from, from things that we recognize in the, in the real world. And I, I love the notion that we often say that creatives don't like guardrails and boxes and constraints, but I think they do. I think they need them because I think giving them the com complete freedom is paralyzing, but, but sometimes putting uh, here's what you can work with go do it uh, I think amazing things can come out of that so I love those two words together yeah I love it beautiful constraints I um there uh I you guys I don't know if you know I'm sure you do know um Javier uh, Capapino um he did a uh an interview with a, a journalist many years ago and I met him right after this um in production uh, a lot of creatives on call with directors go, look, you know, think out of the box, you know, and the truth is, is that there is a box, you know, it's that beautiful constraint, but the box and the guardrails can be infinite in terms of how, and uh, Javier said, you know, it's the one pet peeve that he has in this industry is like, think out of the box, there is a box. So I love beautiful constraints that it's, it's a great, great way of like allowing creative people to think beyond what they ever could imagine within these guardrails of what your client or what you've sold to um, a specific, you know, uh, brand. So I love that. I Bravo. I love that. Great book. It's a great book. Yes. Yes. I'd love that. I'd love to read it. That'd be great. What about you, Jessica? What is your happy uh, and your um, uh, least, uh, you know, happy word or inspiring? For the least, I will bring uh, metaverse. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> this is I, the proof I, that trends go away. Remember last time in Cannes, we were all about metaverse. I was in the in the jury room, and I don't know, at least eighty percent had metaverse somewhere in the case. And now, <laughs> have you heard metaverse? Not at all. There wasn't metaverse at all. So, just remind us to be mindful of the trends and what's going. So it's. It, it can go away. So it's important the idea beyond where it is. And for my favorite, it's a thing that it's part of the philosophy of Wyden. It's provocative, creating uh, work that provokes and makes people feel. It's not just putting work, but provoking something. And it has changed the way I critique work, how I choose work, and it has changed how I how I think of what type of work I put out there. I love that. I love it. I mean, provocative is just, you know, again, my mind goes immediately to, you know, um, films, you know, and I don't know why, but 
um, you guys, we make great little films. And uh, I think being provoked by those films is is what I want, you know. Uh, I'm wearing pink because I'm uh, I'm pro Barbie. I went to see it. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it provoked anything other than wearing pink. <laughs> I love what's happening with Barbie. And I love that Greta Gerwig is behind all that. Like I love every single part of it. Absolutely. Without a doubt. You know, it's one of those things where I got to be honest, like I didn't grow up with Barbie. I don't even understand the movie. Um, I just <laughs> grew up with some friends. I, I really, I don't understand the meaning or anything. It was so exciting and fun and just every aspect of the acting and the directing and the art direction. And, and then just to see this movement happen. So um, uh, we love provoke, um, you know, uh, provocative is a great, great word. I love that. It, it's, it, that is inspiring. Um, Addison, why don't you take the next one? I can take the next one. Um, Jess, we'll start with you this time, kind of reverse it a bit, but <laughs> you're stranded on a desert island. What are two things that you would like absolutely want with you? I mean, I'm a mom, so of course my daughter's body has to be things. Can we can put that. Yeah, okay, let's. Okay, but I would be Fabiana and Romina if, if it can be people. So it would have to be a coloring book and colors because it's my way of meditating. I don't know what happens to me, but when I, when you have to go in the okay. line and have to be in this square as, as the little box and the, I don't know why, but I can relax. I don't, I don't know what this happens to me, but it's <laughs> actually the way I connect with Fabiana. It's the one thing that we can do calmly without... I don't know. I, I, I love coloring books. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. Um, I actually, like, a few years ago, got into, like, adult join the dot, yeah. uh -huh. which is a very similar vibe, I, I guess. I say adult join the dot. It was just slightly more complicated than the ones I did as a child, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So if, if we could put the, the pens and the coloring book as one, I'm going to, like, test you and add, if you could add one more thing i'm gonna be so criticized for this one so criticized but it would be my phone and don't hate me okay <laughs> uh, i think it's a very honest answer that everyone yes, it is, deep it down is, truly it is. believes yeah but unfortunately you're on an island and there's no internet service so i'm oh, not really no sure what's gonna happen <laughs> it was hard for me because i was thinking no a book but which one right yeah, yeah. And and I was thinking which book I could read a thousand times. I don't know, Fight Club, I could read <laughs> that book a thousand times probably. And I'm reading right now Rick Robin book and I, I'm loving it. But Fight Club, I could read it many, 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 many times. <clears throat> wow, love that. Okay, and how about you, Danny? My answer used to always be a boat. Uh, <laughs> of course we need to make some uh, rules for this question yeah, yeah, I right, we do. Do. <laughs> but so I, I i in the spirit of the question um so i, I would bring a, a the a one terabyte ipod with all the music i love all the audio books best of howard stern and then i'd buy i'd bring a solar powered battery pack <laughs> I love you know, that. To go That's with genius. it. You know, I, I gave up two things to make one thing, but I can't yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't go. I don't go a day without at least an hour's worth of music in some form. So I I I'd lose my mind if I didn't have that. How many gigabytes would your Prince collection take up? Because I remember you telling me about this when we did an interview last year. It's uh well, if you take them it's not just music, it's everything. It's every interview, every video, every, so I don't, it's big. If I took all the other stuff out, I think the music would fit. And then there'd be a lot of, there'd be a lot of space. Okay, okay. It'd be a very big, and I went with iPod, just old school. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> it, it's the Fine. biggest one. <clears throat> I was, to be fair, a very late adopter of Spotify. I used my iPod until about two and a half years ago, I'd say, so. I'm with you with the iPod. I don't, like the don't separation. Give it don't give um, it up. It was the iPod dying that kind of forced me, to be honest. Oh, that's um, but Yeah. Uh, how about you, Karen? What are you taking to a desert island? 
Well, you know, it's funny is I also had sort of survival answers. I'm super into like, um, I'm obsessed actually with like survival podcasts and survival stories, wilderness mm -hmm. survival, like lost on an island, lost at sea, like I'm nuts for it. And I love learning all things. So my answer to this was like survival things. Like oh, I, I want to know this. I'm, I want to know. <laughs> well, my first answer was like what Jessica said. I would like my cell phone and cell service. Those are two things. And that was, <laughs> yeah. that was my, but if that's a cheat, I would say that I would bring something to make a fire. So I'd bring like, a, I'd have a flint so I could always make a fire. And then I would bring something that would like a, a knife. So it would allow me to catch fish, make a shelter so I could, get fresh water, like all of the things, those two things so that I could survive for as long as I needed to on there. But also when you make a fire, you can signal to get rescued. So like my answer was about surviving and getting off the island and not lasting on there. So maybe that's the wrong answer, but that was my first a good answer. answer Cause I'm going to be dead, but I'll have music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You'll be smiling. Exactly. I love silence, fortunately. So anyway. But, but don't we don't we want I mean, being on an island, I mean, I guess, you know, if you didn't know you were ever going to be rescued, that would be a little scary. But to be on an island for, uh, you know, silence or music or and not have to worry about the outside world. What a what a treat. Right. No. Yes. Oh, yeah. If you knew you were going to be rescued. Yes. Yeah. yeah. If you knew you would be <laughs> I mean, a couple of days. Yeah. If you're stuck there. It's like, oh. yeah. I know every weekend, every weekend is that. Oh my God, that's hysterical, Karen. You have to like we have to sign you up for um you know season thirty eight of like survival. Oh, I I'm like all the shows, all the podcasts. I'm I'm nuts for it. So why hold it? Where does this come from? Out of interest, this um passion for survival. You know, Just... um, that's a gr great question. I I do like little psychological analysis <laughs> on myself all the time, but I'm really into outdoor. Like I've always been. Okay into wilderness travel and I, I do a lot of adventure stuff like that so it's probably like origins okay. in there but I think connect it to the sort of the world feels really chaotic and yeah like there's probably a confluence of a bunch of different things that that make that create my obsession <laughs> I'm not a prepper but I do I do have some skills I do have some survival skills Okay, <laughs> oh, that's great, Thank Danny. You. Uh, did you know? Apropos to that question from uh, from Addison to Karen, like, did you grow up in a home uh, filled with music, and uh, who was the who was that influence on you? How how, how was that? Yeah. My um, yes, there was music constantly in my house. My mother, <clears throat> my mother actually was a singer, not by trade, but she sang for the USO. Um, from the Virgin Islands, so there's a lot. There was a lot of calypso. My father, uh, my parents. My father was old when he had me, so I grew up with Sinatra and Tony Bennett and uh. Louis Armstrong, and and then I was a DJ when I was in junior high all the way through college. So I, I I'm sure that had a lot to. They had a lot to do with that. I was exposed to music really early. In my first concert, I was, I saw Nina Simone and. Oh my God! And, and and Miles Davis. I I wasn't even old enough to really to understand know who they were, right? <laughs> what yeah. I was looking at, but um, right. so yeah, it started early. Wow, that's amazing, Nina Simone. Um, I think there's a new movie about to come out, right? Uh, oh, about yeah. the life of Nina Simone, which is, is amazing. Uh, yeah. And then for Tony Bennett, uh, I don't know if you guys were fortunate enough to see Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga at the Hollywood Bowl. It was really quite extraordinary. But what a what a humbled man at 90, whatever years old to say that he was kind of, you know, behind the Frank Sinatra guys and just stood in line. I was like, oh my God, this is an amazing, you know, talent. Um, um, what about you, Jessica? You know, there's, you, you had said something about uh, the coloring book. You know, I say to my directors, I was like, look, I don't care if you are the best coloring book artist, like, and I don't know where that comes from. I just try to like make them understand that if you're going to do something, do it great. But the fact that you love coloring and coloring books, um, I don't know. Why didn't Kennedy? That could be a really great new um, uh, offshoot uh, line of uh, Wyden and Kennedy coloring books. <laughs> Let me see <laughs> next year. Wait for it. <laughs> I don't know. I, I also like coloring book from a really young age, and and it calms <clears throat> down. I don't know what it, what it is about that that I have, but. 
I don't have any parents that are like artsy. It's I don't know where that comes from. Instead of Danny, that comes from a, this is a new thing. My father was a doctor with three different specialties, and um, my mother was an actuary. So it was a different type of house. So I don't. Th this is coming from I don't know where. <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm glad it, we we heard it here first. Um, the next question is, uh, did you have a mentor? Who were they and what have they taught you? Um, let's go with you, Jessica. I think I have so much help through the years. For example, I had a boss, Hector Fernandez, at some point that taught me that it's not only to have the position, but you need people to want to work for you. It's not just to have the title, but you need the people to actually want to work for you. So that was a really important lesson for me at that time. And, and now I have a formal mentor. It's my first formal mentor, and it's Susan Hoffman, which I'm, you can imagine how I feel right now. Like I, I, I'm heaven <laughs> of mentorship. And, and one thing in this few months that I've been um, working with her, and I'm understanding feedback because in here it's different than in my past agencies. And it's different in Mexico because culturally in Mexico, when you have to give feedback culturally to give it like straight, it feels harsh in Mexico. You have to say, well, maybe and it's, it's a cultural thing. So you have to work around that. And I'm trying to understand the differences in here, but I'm also trying to build a culture where everyone can say the things because it's about the work, not about you. And and it also has changed the way that I work with people. And it, it has changed like a lot. That 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 little change of, of, of just saying how it is and, and helping people understand that it's not about them, it's about the work. And it changed my mind and 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 how I feel about giving feedback. I love that. Um, this was one of the first, um, you're one of the first guests that we've had outside of the United States. So it's really great to hear cultural, you know, differences and to have such an iconic um, mentor such as Susan, who's, you know, without a doubt, um, one of our, our great leaders. But um, have you, um, uh, uh, you know, started any kind of mentorship or any kind of programs within Widening Kennedy Mexico City yet? Or um, how do uh, the young creatives um, come to you? Or how do you kind of uh, help encourage young 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 talent. I, I'm starting. We're very few. Well, not, not that few. We're 25 already, uh -huh. and right. And uh -huh. I'm starting to 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 understand the difference. And it's something that uh, Susan sent me the difference between superstars and rock stars. Right. Mm -hmm. So understanding in which position those are. It's a uh, it's an, the author of this um, philosophies. I think Skim Scott. So understanding where they are and how to use them and just showing how they can be the best version of them and understand that they are not the same. The, the superstars want to be the next CEO. They want to be me at some point, but the rock stars help you build the foundation of your agency. They want to be the best art director and, and just don't put everyone in the same box. And it's something that I... I also making a difference from my past because it's 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 different for each one. So for my creatives now, I'm I'm bring, I'm like building a panini. You know the 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 album for football where you have your different stickers. I'm trying to hire different stickers. So now instead of trying to to hire this type of creative that wants to you know be famous, now now I'm trying to collect. So you have this superpower. Now you have this other one. So I'm trying to build the most different stickers in my panini at Mexico. I love it. Oh, that's be that's beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, it's a it's a big uh, daunting task, but uh, I'm sure you're up to it. Um, so good luck to you. Um, what about you, Danny? <clears throat> uh, I never, I never had a a mentor in my career and I always wondered whether that was a mistake and I, I've had a coach and I asked the coach should I have a mentor she she asked me do you think you need one and I said no and <laughs> she, said, she said then don't get one I still think I probably should have had one um I said the closest thing to a mentor I've had were my high school art teachers um 
John and, and Gail, they, I, I, I wanted to be an artist when I grew up. That's what I believed I was going to be. And I, and I grew up drawing and painting and they, um, and I spent most of my time when I wasn't in other classes in art class and they, they encouraged me um, and taught me and taught me to uh, help me understand what practice was like and what um, pushed me beyond what I thought I could do. And they, they, they even opened up the, the art class during the summer for three or four of us who were really, really serious about art. So, and, and I mean, to the point where I, I asked my art teacher to be my, my, in my wedding. Um, oh, wow. So she had such an influence on me. And, you know, you hear, you always hear the stories of these teachers that change people's lives. And, and this was, these two were those teachers for me. Um, and the closest thing I had to, to someone that actually helped me see what I could be beyond what I thought I could be. Uh, so they, they, they were proxy for mentors. They were, you know, that was their job. They were teachers. So they're supposed to do, do those things. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. They were, they were life changing. I love that. Did you, do they know that? Do they know that that's how you feel? Have you been able um, to, to I, express that? I, I think they do. I, I used to talk to them long after I graduated high school, after I got out of college. Uh, Cause I had to let them know I didn't ultimately, I went to school for art. I was going to be a, 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 a teacher and then I did not become one. That was another happy accident. <laughs> I found out, found out I was actually a bad teacher, so that wasn't going to work. Uh, but I did talk to them since uh, I talked to them years after after high school. I don't, I, but I hadn't talked. I haven't talked to them in the last probably fifteen years, um, twenty years. So I don't, I don't, I'm not even sure where they are. It's 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 the one thing I asked that because um, I, I think the one you know amazing gift that we um, we we can give and also receive is. You know, we can, we can, you know, it's uh, Maya Angelou said, if you get, give, and if you learn, teach. Um, so the idea that um, you were able to tell someone that uh, so influenced you in your life and how that actually, that present makes them feel. Um, it's something I encourage everybody to do is take the moment, um, find them, um, even if it's an email or a text and tell them what they did for you. And I think that that's also the other part of that is like, you know, you all have such great wisdom and such experience to give to young creatives. And I just love that inspiration and having them hear that you, you know, you, you, there was a, 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 a moment in your life where you were like, should I have a mentor? Or shouldn't I have a mentor? And then here you actually did have a mentor that really changed your life. So I hope uh, young people hear this, uh, this, uh, this episode and, and really are inspired by these words. So thank you for that. Um, but I encourage all of you to to, to reach back out to the people that like influence you and change your life. It's really quite a, a great gift. Um, what about you, Karen? You know, what's interesting is that uh, I know I always joke about how long I've been in this industry, but it, when I was growing up in this industry, I, um, I was often the only woman in creative departments, like literally not just the only female leader, but like the only female in a creative department. And so for most of my career, I didn't have any female kind of leaders to look up to like, I, didn't, I never had a female boss. I never had a female writing partner. Wow. I just, I was in departments where I was just kind of figuring things out myself. But I will say that one of my first bosses at, at Deutsch, this guy, Eric Hirschberg, he, there, there was something very human about the way he led. Um, he was an incredibly persuasive um, and compelling public speaker, which is something I had to learn to do myself because I tend to be sort of an introverted shy person. Um, he taught me that, but he, he, while he wasn't sort of that see it, be it that I was kind of longing for, um, he did give me all the opportunities that everyone else had. I got the, I got the great briefs. He did promote me. He, um, he did things that I, I have brought into my leadership style, which is just be human, you know, like come in and ask people how they are and talk about what you did over the weekend. And, you know, sort of proactively give people what they deserve and don't wait for them to ask for it. Things like that, that I just observed, like, that's good. Like that feels instinctively good to me as a leader. Um, he was one of the best that I had seen at the time of how to articulate an idea, how to make sure you have an idea and then how to articulate it clearly. And then how to, you know, that kind of stuff. So 
those were all mentorship things that I needed at the time. But I will say that I very much long to have that, that female mentor that I never had. And so that's when I first started getting involved in the 3% conference years ago, which is actually how I first met Kristen Cavallo, full circle kind of things, is I was very passionately involved in that. Like, how can I give back? How can I create mentorship and opportunities in a way that I never received? And so that's, it's become really active. I try, I really, really create an open door kind of thing here at the agency where anybody, regardless of your level, can come in and talk to me, ask advice, what, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I create a sort of mentorship time, like office hours where people of all levels can come in and ask questions. I, I create a, a, like a lot of transparency so people feel like it's a safe space. But so in essentially, I'm kind of creating what I felt that I didn't have, but in a way that was a gift because it gave me a lot of passion to pursue that. It kind of gave my my sort of career, that sense of, of sort of driving purpose, you know? I love that. I, I Look, there's so many nuggets to pull out of that. Um, the fact that you have an open door policy, um, that's also great for young people to hear is like, you know, um, you talk to leaders and you see them and you, 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 you put them on such a high pedestal and like, how could I ever get to, uh, you know, a Karen Costello or a Danny Robinson or a Jessica? Um, and the fact that you, you, you've allowed people to uh, come into your space, I think is really amazing. And you've encouraged that um, because I think a lot of people don't know that. Uh, uh, what about you, Danny? Do you have that kind of open door? How do how do pe how does young people or anybody um, it, within your organization or even outside of your organization that really support you and look up to you? How do they get to you? Um, they just ask. I they either. I mean, it's I've made it clear, and I make it clear to everyone who comes in that the door is except for now, it's literally open. I say, if I'm here <laughs> and you want to talk to me, either stand there, and if I'm not. If I can, I'll talk to you. <laughs> and if I don't, just go ask my executive assistant and get time. That's that's it's silly not to. I don't even understand people who don't make time for the people that are working for them. Um, right. And it's it's certainly we we all have busy, you know, our calendars are full. Yeah, but it, it's not it's they're not that full. I mean the the the, the you know I would say we can never spend enough time worrying about, thinking about, talking about the people that work for us, um, because that's all we have really in the end. And I, I know Karen, what Karen said is what Karen, she's preaching what she, or practices what she preaches. She did it when she was right. here. Um, and it's the culture of Martin anyway. Um, right. So it's just, if you want to talk to me, just talk to me. And it's weird when people feel like they can't. I don't, so that's weird. I'm just a guy sitting in an office. <laughs> but you Just, know but you know but it, it is good for 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 young people to hear that that you like think that that's weird because you know there's always the squeaky wheel gets the oil well yeah there's all those people and they do rise to the top uh and sometimes they're great and sometimes they're not but it's for those young people who are afraid to ask and you don't understand like ask take a chance open your mouth like walk into the door like you know raise your hand like don't don't sit on the sidelines because you might be that next star rock star are you might be that next you know um uh leader so um are you may have that next great idea right karen and i don't know we also leave the office i also just walk around and oh that, yeah, yeah what are you yeah. what are you doing <laughs> just i just i don't have, <laughs> i don't always wait because i know there are some people who even though they know the door is open won't just it's just not in their nature to it's not easy for them so i just right. i force it on them um which you know, it's still maybe not easy for them, but I think it's it's either come see me or I come to you. I love that. Well, I think that's uh, all of that was amazing. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, we have the one of the last questions, uh, although there is a bonus if we have time. Uh, what's the most important risk that you've taken? Um, and what, uh, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, and was it worth the risk um, or not? Um, let's go with you, Danny. Uh, I was given the opportunity to, to leave the creative department and and be a chief client officer at Martin because I I made the mistake of saying I'm a little bored in this role, but, <laughs> but I don't want to leave. So what do you what do you think I can do? And Kristen uh, and our president Chris at the time started throwing out ideas because I didn't have any. And Kristen said, "Why don't you why don't you uh, why don't we create a role 
you can lead the account, you can be head of the account leadership department. You can kind of be a bridge because you know creative between Karen at that time and the and creative department and the account leadership and give them a different perspective because you you didn't come from account. And then be a, a, a facing, outward facing person for clients um, and make sure the clients we have stay. Um, and I thought it was a sound. It was a terrible idea. Um, <laughs> creative becoming a suit sounded absolutely the last thing I wanted to do. But Kristen, Kristen has a way of. She's a very good salesman. She has a way of. Um, what she does is she said, "Well, write your own job description." She always says that. So I ended up making it what I wanted it to be, and um, spent two, three. I don't know how long, Karen. I don't know, two, three years before yeah, Karen left and then I came back. So my, my fear was being banished from the creatives. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, we're going to the dark side and never being able to come back. But the, what I learned in those two years or three years were, were, was incredibly valuable for what I'm doing now. And it was just, a, I, I spent two or three years learning something that I didn't know. Um, and it helped me, it prepared me for this role in an in a interesting way as it relates to just managing the people in a department. I love that. I mean, you know, look, I, again, acknowledging the fact that leaders um, don't just, you know, they don't, they are born, but there is a thread that happens from the time that you're born and you're a child in high school. And, and you see that thread of you being fearless or taking a risk or, or seeing an opportunity and saying yes, instead of no, or raising your hand or not raising your hand. And I think that, you know, that's, you know, I've never heard that story, and I don't know how how often that particular your story has happened. But to go from a creative department to a suit to clients is like that's scary for me. It's never going to happen to me, but it's just like scary for me. You know, um, that's amazing, young man. That's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was something. And what about you, Karen? Well, interesting. My my risk is is sort of interconnected with with Danny and the wonderful people at Martin. But I will say also just really quick, Danny's super humble. He has an MBA. Like yeah, his background I, is yeah. incredible. Like yes, yeah. not not very many creative people have also an MBA. So he's very humble. But um, anyway, um, so my, one of my biggest risks, but one of the most transformative rewards of my career, was the decision to move my family across. I'm a California native moved my family across the country to a, a big agency in a small town in Virginia, in the South, the heart of the Confederacy at the time. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was a big risk. And that, that was the first part of the risk. And then the second part of the risk was very quickly after being asked to be the CCO at a, at a moment in that agency's sort of um, a little bit of turmoil. Um, and it was scary, you know, as all risks are, it was, kind of terrifying and my inclination was like I think I just want to move back to California and go back to but um I stuck it out and was the best one of the best decisions I made it sort of intertwined my story with Danny's story and, and Kristen's story and all the incredible people at that agency but it transferred me as a leader um it it just completely changed the trajectory of my career but the way I looked at advertising and creative departments and humanity and all that kind of, I mean, it just was transforming, but it was at the time terrifying. <laughs> and then he was right beside me at that time. So he knows how terrifying it was. I love it. And then you went back to Deutsch, which is, uh, I, again, talk about a full circle moment. Um, yes, yeah, I, right. th I think, you know, the, the you know, uh, other than the, the heart of the Confederacy, the fact that you have to have two, you can't directly fly to Virginia really scares me. Um, <laughs> right. Is there a direct flight? No, right. Nope. Nope. Yeah. Not from where Karen is. You can yeah, go know, to Dulles. That. You can fly yeah, directly to Dulles and drive down. But yeah. Exactly. There you go. Um, what about you, Jessica? I'll say having my first child at the same time as becoming a creative VP in publicist. It oh. was the most craziest uh, year of my life because mm -hmm. I was in this position of accepting that position. But at the same time, I wanted to be a great mom. And I've heard in the past people uh, saying like, no, we shouldn't give that position to that girl because she's been going pregnant. So I, we don't know if she could handle the pressure. So that also gave me like the, the, the wanting and the eager to, no, I want to prove that you can be a mom and also handle a complete creative department and, and 
once I kind of managed that, my partner helped a lot. Diego Wallach helped me a lot to manage that. And then changing jobs a few months later, because why not? You already managed that. Then you should change a job and prove yourself <laughs> in another agency. That's, here's the moment where you should do that. Hmm. So changing jobs to Ogilvy. And I think that year, I don't know why uh, motherhood gave me some kind of bravery. I, I don't know what happened, which wires connected. And I just want to prove to the this little baby that you could say yes to stuff, even if when when Fabiana grew up and she could look at my life and, and she could feel inspired to do some changes and risk. I don't know if you feel like the same kind, like it, it they, they motivate you to, to be more out there and to be more productive and meetings that could last two hours now can be managed in 30 minutes. And you can manage so much more when you're a mother and, and you find out until you're a mother. 1000%. I, I think I underscore that um, hugely. Actually, being a mother was one of the things that made me decide to sort of take that risk and, and make the decision to stay because my daughter was watching. You know what I mean? Like I my daughter watching attention <laughs> to like what I'm doing, you know, and it matters. It matters Eric a lot. Say that to me Just out loud. <laughs> With that, Danny? That very thing. My daughter's watching. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Ah, I love that. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, you also said something, Jessica, which I think is something that, um, you know, as leaders, it's often very lonely at the top, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I, in my experience. Um, but you said that you reached out uh, and your partner was very helpful. And to be able to have a support uh, uh, network or a group of people or one person that you can always go to or turn to, to um, ask for that support and help, I think is really, really important for all of us, you know, uh, in life uh, and not be afraid of that, you know. Um, but um, we're out of time, guys. I just wanted to thank you. You guys are all inspiring. You're all amazing. Uh, you made my day. Uh, you, you you gave my heart a, a lot, a lot of uh, power and energy today. I really just, time is very valuable. I appreciate your time. Thank you all. Um, and keep uh, leading the the great fight. You guys are amazing. I do want to say that uh, in production, uh, we used to say, "Oh, what are we curing cancer?" But the truth is that in during the pandemic, you guys did so much more. You know what I mean? Like you really um, uh, created uh, an environment and an atmosphere of storytelling and enough human um, cause, and it changed cultures. It changed lives. So. I, from the production communities, want to thank you guys for that. Truly, you should be just uh, so, so proud. Thank, thank you, you, Oliver. Thank you I'm for us. sad I'm not hearing the dinner companions. I'll, I'll get them from them separately. We yeah. can, <laughs> we can run through them if you've got time, I guess. Well, you know what? We, if, if you have two minutes, <laughs> uh, Addison, you have two minutes? Addison? I, mean, I, I can wait, yeah. Okay, great. Let's do it. Let's do it really quickly. Danny, uh, if you uh, if you could choose anybody, because I do want to hear what it is. Anybody um, for dinner, four or five, six people, who would they be? Um, uh, Addison, who's the first person? Prince. Prince. Anybody. Prince. That's, that's an Prince. obvious one. Prince. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Prince, Dave Chappelle, uh, Dr. Cornell West, and Bruce Lee. Oh, my God. Wow. That's, I mean, what would you serve? I mean, well, you would need. <laughs> That's it. I'm not, I'm being. Catered. It's I'm catered. not cooking. I'm not cooking. I know, I'm like, I'm talking. I'm listening. You're actually listening, right? Yeah, I'm being served. I don't know what's on. <laughs> That's brilliant. I love that. Imagine Bruce Lee and Prince, uh, you know, Cornell. That's just a sick, sick, sick. I'd love to be at that, uh, that dinner party. Yeah, I would too. Uh, what about you, Jessica? Um, then widen because I was supposed to talk with him, but I got hired just the week that he passed away. So uh, that was, I was like, oh, I could have yeah. uh, David Bowie because for me it's like love. Yeah. Oh, yes. Elvis Presley, just because I want to tell him that he actually got to be the king. And I think he died without knowing. So I just oh. want him to know. <laughs> right? Because I started moving like, no, he died without knowing what we, we need to tell him. <laughs> and uh, Lily Allen, because there's one record that I, I'm sure Danny would have happened this that you, you connect with a 
album specifically and you feel that you are really connected to that moment and I connect with no shame from Lily Allen at some point in my life. So I just want to talk to her about that album in particular. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one as well. What about you, Karen? Um, I guess I love pe people who tell great stories. I mean, you know, obviously I'm in a storytelling business, so I love storytellers. And probably because I'm a little bit more introverted and shy, I would invite people to my dinner party that would tell great stories and I could just listen, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, so I love David Sedaris. Like he's hilarious. He tells real stories and they're funny, funny, funny. Ira Glass, because I love uh, the stories he tells of Americans that are like the sort of invisible stories that you don't hear about. I love, I could just hear Ira Glass talk forever. Rachel Maddow, because I love uh, how she connects history and current events in a storytelling way that makes it super clear. Like it's all of a sudden like, ah, oh, now I understand why this is happening. And also bell hooks, like bell hooks. I, I uh, read bell hooks at a time that was really transformative in my life where she just like blew my mind. It like opened my mind to the concept of intersectionality and gender and race. Like it just, she is one of the most inspirational people. So anyway, if I had all those people together, I could just listen to them talk. <laughs> I love it. Well, what a great, 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 uh, a great day. Thank you guys so much. We really appreciate we it. added that, by the way. That was just three solid answers to end on. So thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, worth the extra four minutes for sure. Yeah, thank you for pushing us, Danny. Danny, uh, Jessica, <laughs> and Karen, thank you so much. Have a great day, guys. Bye.